On behalf of Circle Economy, a very warm welcome to all of you. We're here in Blue City, a circular hub in the Netherlands, right in the heart of Rotterdam. Today, we're presenting the circular state of the planet in our annual circularity gap report. Personally, I'm very excited to hear from the authors of the report, but also from our panelists across the world. I'll hand you over now to our moderator, Lynn Zebeda. Take it from here. We have been properly welcomed now with almost an ode to the champion of circularity, which is our living planet, and which we are here for, in fact. Um, before I go into the interview uh, with the authors, let us listen to a message from Professor David Takayoshi Suzuki. You must know him, he's world-renowned Canadian scientist, co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. He's a broadcaster, he's an environmental activist, and he recorded this message specifically for us today. I speak to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations who cared for these lands and waters for thousands of years. For almost all of human existence, we knew that we live within a complex web of relationships with all other animal species and plants, with air, water, soil, and sunlight, and in recognizing that our survival and well-being depend on these relationships, we have always felt an enormous responsibility to act properly to keep it all going. But very recently, since the Renaissance, we've begun to think we are different and special, that our intelligence elevates us above or outside of the laws of nature. Telescopes, microscopes, and machines let us exceed any biological constraints of our senses and our muscles. We can fly at hundreds of kilometers per hour, live in outer space, release energy in atoms, and design life forms, including our children, to our specifications. Truly, we have become like gods, since there seem to be no limits to human imagination or productivity, economists think endless growth is possible. In a finite world, it is not. When growth becomes the very measure of progress, we fail to ask the important questions. What is an economy for? Are there no limits? How much is enough? Are we happier with all this stuff? Canada is probably more vulnerable to climate change than any other industrialized country. We are a northern country. The Arctic is warming at three times the world rate. We have the longest marine coastline in the world, so sea level will pound us. The Arctic ice sheet and all our glaciers are melting. Climate-sensitive parts of our economy are already impact. Agriculture, forestry, fisheries, winter sports, tourism, transportation, energy, and insurance. While climate impacts by floods, storms, water shortages, fire, and fossil fuels affect Canada profoundly. During the COVID-induced lockdown, jobs were lost. Elders and caregivers died disproportionately. Small businesses struggled or went broke. People were shut away. Social interactions were disrupted. People needed to help meet payments, pay rent, and put food on the table. As emissions kept rising, ecosystems and species continued to disappear. Plastic pollution of oceans, overfishing and pesticide use carried on. At the very same time, the stock market rose to new heights and the obscenely wealthy continued to pile up profits. What doesn't compute here? The needs of most people in the world 
and the biosphere are not being met while the economy and the market celebrate continued growth. So clearly the economy is somehow disconnected from the real world we all live in and depend on. I'm not an economist, but it's obvious a circular economy acknowledges limits set by the biosphere itself and focuses on primary human needs. That's what is desperately needed today. What a beautiful message from David Suzuki. And um, he really speaks to the urgency of why we need to talk about this. Now, in this interview, I hope we can also talk about how are we going to get there then? How are we going to put the circular economy uh, thinking in motion? How will we translate it? Um, so we're discussing the main insights of this report, fresh off the press, press circularity gap report, with two of its authors. We have Mark De Witt on, the, on my right, Director of Strategic Alliances at Circle Economy. And then we have Matthew Fraser. Matthew, you are the lead of the Circularity Gap Reporting Initiative within Circle Economy. Um, happy to be able to, to be here together and to discuss this. And I would like to start with you, Mark, just at the beginning, why did Circle Economy start writing this report four years ago? What gap were you filling? <laughs> well, I think we were, um, as an organization, already working on circular economy for about eight or nine years now, uh, but back then, two or three years. And what we saw is that there was a lot of awareness around the circular economy, how it could deliver key solutions uh, to the planet. Yeah. Uh, we saw progressive governments uh, including it in their policies, front-running businesses adopting it. But there was one key thing missing, and that was really... Um, a sense of where do we stand currently? How circular are we currently? The globe, your city, your business, your country. Um, and that was really where we uh, started to think, well, maybe we can uh, run an analysis and really um, give an answer to the question, how circular is the are world today? Are we today? today? Yeah, that so was that really we know, are we doing well? Are we not? Just to make it more concrete. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. And I do want to ask you, actually, Matthew, this circular economy thinking, it sounds beautiful, but it can also kind of be an abstract phrase. Um, I want to ask you to make it a little bit personal for a second. Like, what does it mean to you and why are you so dedicated to it? I know you worked super hard on this, for instance. Yeah. Why uh, the dedication? No, absolutely. Um, well, I'm from North America, from Canada, so I actually grew up listening to David Suzuki. On the television. On the television nice. almost every week. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, growing up kind of in that context, there's, there really is this sort of almost mantra of, you know, bigger is better, this sort of almost American dream where everybody wants a big house, two cars, a boat, a pool, a uh, home theater, and it, 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 these things just keep growing. Um, yeah, really planted after. in us as that's what you need to strive for in life. Yeah. And at the same time, people aren't necessarily happier when they kind of strive to achieve those things. And I think, you know, growing up and also being more conscious of, Kind of the world around us, you can see, wow, how how much at odds that lifestyle is really with the ecological destruction that's happening year after year and really getting worse. So I think, for me, just coming back to your question, you know, circular economy really kind of puts that to words. You know, we're really trying to optimize both uh, human well-being and ecological safety at the same time, and it's really about that balance rather than kind of the pursuit of growth uh, of all, at all costs. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful ambition and it's a necessary ambition, but the world is actually becoming less circular, we've seen, because in the previous report, the overall circularity metric was at 9.1%. Now we have fallen to 8.6%. What is happening here? Can you explain that trend, Mark? Yeah, so in, in, in simple words, indeed, four years ago, 9.1%. Uh, actually, last year in the report, the big revelation was 8.6%. Right, yeah. And there are two key things that are at play here. One is um, we use more than 100 billion tons of materials every year in the economy. In 1900, that was only 7 billion tons. So we are, and we are on the path by 2050 to go to 175. So from 7 to 100 in a century? To 175, to 175. Uh, in, 20, in 2050. So we're using increasingly more stuff. 
Um, and at the other end, we're not cycling that back into our economy, but yeah. actually, um, well, 9% um, of our economy is circular, 91% is linear. So the rest ends up as waste. So we're not able to bring it back into our economy. And, right. and that's really why we see that all the indicators are in the red. We keep on using more stuff. We're unable to cycle things back, to use things longer in our economy. So to really slow a bit of the pace of whether it's fast fashion, whether it's home appliances, yeah. whether it's cars that you use, really slowing that down, cycling more, and just using less to satisfy our needs. Back to, well, what, what uh, Matthew just ex uh, described as well. Yeah, exactly, because when we think about circular economy, maybe we think especially about using it again, recycling it, but it's really about using less, using it longer, making it cleaner, and, and using it again at the yeah. end. Um, but can you maybe explain to me what this 8.6 number really means. 8.6% of our economy is circular. What are we saying then, actually? Right. Well, it, it, it comes back a bit to what I just tried to, to say. So yeah. um, on the one hand, for um, our houses, um, our, uh, what we eat, our mobile phone, uh, how we move from A to B, yeah. for all of those societal needs, as humankind, we used 100 billion tons of stuff. Yeah. And of that, 8.6 billion tons goes back into the economy. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's really, really about the, the how much are we able to use again the, the, and put that's back the, into the cycle. That's what the metric yeah. really tries to say, which is an extremely yeah. bare uh, metric, but also a very important one. It just mm -hmm. shows to well how much is not coming back. And, and that's kind of the key insight we try to bring with this report, really bringing down a lot of compl complexity of our global economy. But really, that number is so telling in, in what's wrong in that system. Yeah. Well, and then we also dedicate um, much of the report to what actually can be done to improve that. Improve system. things, exactly. Which that's, is, of course, where it becomes crucial. Where it becomes extra interesting. Although this is also very important to kind of let's sink in that, indeed, of those 100 billion tons, we lose almost everything. 8.6% yeah. is what we are able to cycle back, but the rest is just uh, pretty much gone. Yeah. Um, OK, let us look at a little video that captures the spirit of this report. Matthew, I want to ask you, this video, it speaks to our ability as humans to change our ways, pretty much, but it also very much speaks to that link between global warming and the circular economy. Um, we are now on track, uh, as it says in the report as well, to two or three degrees global warming, which is as bad as a person having a two or three degree fever permanently. Um, and in the report, you emphasize that the circular, like circular strategies can very much help tackling our greenhouse gas emissions problem, actually even a lot more than we expected. Um, can you tell us in concrete terms, how would that work? How is it part of the solution? 
Sure. Yeah, I think with uh, this circularity gap report for the first time, actually, we're not only looking at circularity itself, but actually how circularity influences you know, other global issues and what yeah. other global issue in this century than climate change to address. So I think I'm very proud actually to say that the circular economy enacted globally does have the potential to actually close the emissions gap fully. Um, what that means is if we adopt a roadmap uh, packed with circular economy strategies, by 2032, we can achieve a well below two degree pathway. Uh, and that's also on par to bringing us to a net neutrality, um, uh, net neutral by 2044. So really great news. I think maybe just to get at your question, um, the emissions gap report that just came out last month, uh, the recent, most recent version, mm -hmm. made it quite clear uh, and issued quite a stark warning about the state of the world. Indeed, we are on track to um, quite, uh, quite high global warming. 3.2, I believe. 3.2. Yeah. Uh, and if we look actually at where, kind of where we would be, business as usual by 2030, the current commitments, so the, the current policies made by nations are only going to really bring us about 15% of the way there to that well below two degree pathway. Mm -hmm. the, the other 85% is really circular economy. So it's uh, really exciting news. Um, lots of really uh, powerful, but also really practical solutions here. So yeah, and let's, let's go into that. Um, because in the report you mentioned that there are three uh, key areas where we can get up to 70% emissions reduction, and that is housing, mobility, and nutrition. Um, I would really like to ask you to give some examples of very promising or very important strategies for transition within those areas, and maybe we can start with mobility. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, th there are kind of obvious societal needs uh, that really actually make up the, the sort of lion's share of the, the emissions that we have today, mobility actually being the top one. And I think uh, it comes as no surprise just the amount of fossil fuels really being burned um, by vehicles today and, and the, yeah. uh, the mobility system overall. Um, lots to do there, but I think actually one thing that we've all kind of realized over the, the past almost year, shockingly enough, mm -hmm. uh, with the coronavirus and the lockdowns is actually just reducing travel can actually bring us a long way in, in terms of re reducing those emissions. Um, so the biggest um, uh, savings can actually just come from traveling less. So actually when we look forward to the post-COVID recovery, you know, thinking about more permanent models of uh, virtual work or flexible workspaces that are maybe more remote and kind of avoid people commuting in and out of cities more structurally. Um, but also when you look at kind of new business models, you know, sharing, um, sharing models are exploding in kind of all major cities around the world and it's actually changing fundamentally people's attitudes about car ownership. Yeah. Um, I think that's also a really big uh, powerful lever, but then when you even combine that further with circular design so that these vehicles, whatever they are, sort of electric bikes or you know, full scale family vehicles, you know, if they are designed for uh, longevity, uh, but also repairability, cyclability, um, that's really a game changer. So that's... Uh, exactly. Yeah. So we need mobility vehicles that last, that we can repair, and that we can share all at the same time. Exactly. So it's really thinking, re fundamentally rethinking the whole model. Yeah. Interesting. I'm curious about the, the next as well. If we look at housing, because from the report that really stood out as a giant area where we can improve. Yeah. How, 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 how? <laughs> How do we do it? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a big question. It's, a, it's also a big impact area, housing. I mean, you know, th think of the, the energy that we spend sort of heating and cooling and mm -hmm. lighting and running our homes. Um, you know, th the same thing uh, again. I, I mean, thinking from a, from a system's point of view, I mean, you know, how do we use space better? I think fundamentally in, in big cities, uh, and again, going back to, to COVID, um, you know, we see a lot of empty space that, that actually could be used a lot better. So even thinking about sort of co-housing, um, you know, better utilization of uh, sort of disused or underused space. Um, but also the way that we build. Uh, fundamentally, again, there's a, there's a really big role for design in the circular economy. Yeah. So yeah. not only kind of disassembly and cyclability, but actually modularity, making sure that spaces are adaptable and, and functional in many different ways. And uh, what we've really looked at in this report is, you know, how can we maximize um, the, the, the use of secondary inputs, so the use of waste. So when you look at sort of old wood or old concrete, you know, how can we actually uh, sort of close that, that loop and actually use that as the main 
use old building materials for new buildings. Exactly. Are we able to do that at scale? <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I think that's really where um, the, the kind of action really needs to happen over the next uh, 10 years especially is, you know, there, there are a plethora, there are more than enough uh, really great examples if you kind of look around the world. It's really about consolidating those, really driving innovation sort of consistently in that industry and scaling. So yeah. I, I think the, the inspiration is there. It's really about putting it into practice. Yeah. And also really taking stock and seeing what is there. We have all this space. We have all these materials. How are we using them? Um, and how do we want to use them? Because also going back to your example of everyone wants a big house and a big this and a big that. How, what is it that we aspire to is important there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there are a lot of other innovations, um, even when looking at, you know, sort of bio-based materials. I mean, there are really great examples of, of buildings that are sort of built with bio-based materials that are actually carbon neutral. The, yeah. The, the building itself is carbon neutral. Uh, and I think what we don't see um, within that story is also the, you know, the benefit to things like indoor air quality, the, yeah. the, the benefit of actually having a healthier environment, but also you know, when looking at sort of biological construction materials, the, the, the economic benefit to rural communities, where now the story is very sort of city-centric. So I think there's a lot there um, uh, in terms of co-benefits, let's say, yeah. to the circular economy. Yeah. All right. The last area that was one of those big three is nutrition. Um, and let me ask you, because it's, it's such a giant system to, to look at, right, the food system, are the solutions for the nutrition sector in this report or in your thinking more directed at the consumption side or at the production side? What do we especially need to do differently? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a great way of looking at it. I think there's, the food chain is global, it's huge. Um, yeah. There's a production aspect of it and there's a consumption aspect of it. And I think if we look at, let's say, uh, sort of Western countries, we really need to rethink our consumption and especially reducing excess consumption. Uh, Western countries now um, commonly suffer from diseases like obesity, um, but also feature sort of food waste rates that are above 30%. I think there's a yeah, lot of room exactly. there to focus on, but also for, let's say, agriculturally dominant economies, things like uh, uh, regenerative agricultural practices, which of course take a wide variety of approaches, but these approaches consistently put carbon back into the, uh, into the soil, um, build biodiversity, also build more um, diversity in local economies as well. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a big story there, especially for the, the social side. Yeah. Interesting. There's so much more to say about each and every one of these, uh, these topic areas. Uh, read the report, I would say, definitely. And we'll have some more time to, uh, to go into the details with our wonderful panel in a bit. Um, but for now, Matthew, I mean, we, all the thinking is there and, there, and there's a lot more to think about, of course, and, to, uh, and consultations to be done, et cetera. But how can countries get involved or how can people get involved with this work to just get going? Well, I think actually one of the, the great things that we've seen with the Circularity Gap Reporting Initiative as a whole uh, yeah. is actually the power of data. So as, as Mark was saying, you know, a few years ago, we didn't even know how circular we were. Now we're able to perform that analysis on a, on a country level and even a regional level. Um, I'm actually quite excited to uh, really sort of lean into that direction and, and embrace the power of data. Um, and uh, I'm even uh, proud to advertise today that we're really calling on people to co-create this, uh, this online platform with us where we can really kind of bring the, the data that sits sort of locked up in these pages yeah. to life. Um, so not only reporting on not only letting sort of local actors understand how they're making progress, but also how they can learn from others, inspiring great examples, um, and, and really tracking that progress over time. So I, I would call for anybody uh, working on circular economy within nations really to co-create this platform with us. And I think that can... Where can we find the platform? How do we get on it? Good point. Uh, you can always find it at uh, circularity-gap.world. Uh, Circularity-gap. Dot world. Dot world. Yeah. Nice. If you go to contact us, there's a little uh, tick box there for you to, to get in touch. So, okay. Yeah. okay, so you've highlighted some of the key points from this report. Obviously, that circular strategies are such a huge part of the climate crisis solutions to reduce emissions, really mitigation solutions. Um, that housing, mobility, and food, nutrition are 
key areas to zoom into because then that's where 70% of the impact actually is. Um, and then we can all get involved. <laughs> <laughs> actually, right. yeah, we can get started. Um, all right. Would you like to add anything, Mark, before we go into the panel? Well, I'm very curious to, um, to learn actually from the panel um, how they would put this to practice in their own kind of context. I think what we try to do with this report is really sketch the global picture. Yeah. As an organization, we work uh, with cities um, across the world. We work with uh, nation states, for example, recently with Austria, with the Netherlands, with Norway in Europe now. Um, in the, the, the province of Quebec in Canada, so mm -hmm. first time outside of Europe, and we really aspire to do much more um, across the globe in, in that realm. Um, but I think we have an, an exciting panel uh, waiting, so I would love to learn from them how they view this report, but also how they see it translated back to their local context and how we can really learn from all of those different perspectives in, in really making um, well, what we write down here, how we can really make that practice. Yeah, exactly. Because it's one thing to sketch a certain framework and a certain vision, but then to translate it or to actually, yeah, see what, what the reality is on the ground in different contexts. You can't also um, have one blueprint for this is how we're going to do it. Exactly. World. Yeah. Um, that's going to be very interesting to see. Thank you, gentlemen. I hope that we have get a little bit of insight into what we can expect from this report and what's so exciting actually about um, the findings. I would like to introduce our panel of today, uh, a panel of influential pioneers with very high ambitions that are working towards a circular econ economy, that are doing all they can uh, to tackle climate change uh, from their positions. Um, as we saw, we have His Excellency Mr. Kijandria, uh, Minister of Environment of Peru. We have Mr. Martin Frick, uh, Deputy to the Special Envoy for the UN Food Systems Summit. And we have Professor Anthony Young, uh, Director for Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. And together uh, with this wonderful panel, we will see what is happening already and how can we move forward together, specifically and especially. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Kijandria, I would like to start uh, with you, if possible. You are the Minister of Environment, as we said. You have 20 years of experience prior to that in environmental policy with emphasis on climate change, financing for sustainable development, biodiversity conservation, which is such a crucial aspect of this conversation as well. Um, and in 2019, together with the Ministry of Production, uh, your ministry launched a roadmap towards a circular economy uh, with a number of goals and approaches on sustainable consumption, the use of waste material and industrial waste, innovation and financing, so four key areas. And what I want to, would like to ask you is, could you please share how you are faring with this roadmap? Thank you, thank you, Lynn. And first of all, let me let me thank the Embassy of the Netherlands here in, in Lima for for their coordination for us for us to join this interesting interesting panel. It's 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 an honor uh, to be to be part of it. And 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 for Peru, it's a circular economy is a bet. It's a serious bet in terms of uh, reshaping our our development model. And, 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 and we understand circular economy as something not only uh, associated to retrofitting what has been done in the past or, 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 or how do we do uh, things uh, better or, or in, in a different way in, in areas where, where our country has been already developed in, 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 in industries such as mining or, or fishing or, or manufacturing. But, but also circular economy has, has to be seen as a new way of doing things, uh, as a new model for the development of, of those areas of our country, for instance, that hasn't been developed uh, enough yet. For instance, the Amazon. Uh, the the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has brought some discussions about uh, the, the, the need to, 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 to think out of the box. And, and do we need those... Uh, highways that we were planning or, or that were planned or that has been asked for, for by population 
for um, more than 50 years for them to connect to the rest of the economy or it's broadband Wi-Fi uh, more crucial right now for them to be able to receive um, or, or to make financial operations uh, at, at, at the distance and, and, and they can uh, provide their, their products, biodiversity based products for instance, uh, not, not needing this uh, kind of impact or, or, or the scale of impact that a big highway might, might, might generate. And, and, and we uh, at the Ministry of the Environment had put uh, a lot of effort in pushing the, the, the idea of, of circular economy, of this new model uh, that, that, that needs to, to, to connect ecosystems, uh, productive systems with the, the, the industrial sector and the post-consumption, um, what happens after, after the consumption of, of, of the goods and, uh, that, that are generated by, by, the, by these production systems. And, and, and we have been able to uh, include the, the discussion of the circular economy, for instance, in our national policy and plan for competitiveness and, and, and productivity, uh, allowing, allowing this issue to be a discussion that uh, surpasses the environmental realm and enters the, the, the economic and the, the, the uh, economic, economic growth discussion. Uh, something that, that is absolutely fundamental in this uh, joint, we, we, this joint situation, we, this, this current situation we have uh, with, with the need of, of, of economic recovery happen. We have been working, as, as, as you said, Lynn, in the, in the, in the roadmaps for, for, for certain priority uh, industries, such as the manufacturing, uh, fish processing, and, and, and we, we're, which, which already have approved the, the, the roadmaps, and we are working in the development of the roadmaps for uh, uh, fisheries and, and, and aquaculture and agriculture as uh, main, main sectors that the, uh, we will uh, work in, in terms of promoting the, the cleaner production, freedom of production agreements, the use of, uh, of, of renewables, the, the, the inclusion. Of, of, of this in a, in a wide level uh, Peruvian pact for, for, the, for circular economy. That is, that is something that we are trying to, 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 to craft before we are leaving because our, our government ends in, in July this, this year and, 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 to, and to push for a Peru circular platform that, that will be the, the tool for, for all sectors of the government, of the private sector of civil society to push for uh, the, 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 the circular economy agenda in the country. Very, Thank very interesting. Much. Thank you very much for enlightening us on that. And I, I am very fascinated by how you describe the need to balance the social needs and the livelihoods needs and the sustainability needs. And it takes some very wise decision making to, to navigate that. Uh, and I would like to, to ask you if you would be willing, willing to share I mean, the, the roadmap is there, the vision is there. What is a, a key challenge that you have, that you face in implementing this roadmap? And how do you overcome this? Also for your colleagues around the world to be able to learn from you. What is, what is a key challenge in really making this real and how to, to get beyond that? Well, there, there are many challenges, but, but, but I think I, I, I might uh, focus in, in, in one of them. Finance will be one. Finance, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, getting the finance sector to uh, bet for, 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 for this new approach will be, will be a challenge. Um, we have access to climate finance, we have access to this environmental finance, but, but in, our, in our experience, and, and, and I have been very, very much involved in the, in the, in the Green Climate Fund, for instance, um, I think this, this uh, climate with, with this finance with last names are not enough. What we need is to, 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 to get all the finance uh, to be aligned and all the finance to, to, to mainstream the environmental and the circularity and the resilience and low carbon and all, all these adjectives need to be incorporated in, yeah. the, in the mainstream of the, of the financial things. Because these are the business of the future. These are the business that are going to be 
uh, the, 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 the ones generating the more profit for the private sector. So the, that, that will be the challenge, to demonstrate that, that this new uh, approach is the one that, it's, that, 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 that consumers want, uh, want, want to be present. Yeah. Not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries, because our, our, our world is now so interconnected because of the of internet and, and, and all this social media that sensibilities and, and, and emotion that, that is generated in one part of the world uh, crosses the world exactly. in five seconds and, and finds another another person with the same feelings. In, in, a, in a different yeah. country with a different context. Yeah, we're connected in so many ways, more than we realize, yeah. Thank you for this point, and I want to hold on to your point about financing, because I think uh, and a number of the other, the other panelists also have uh, a view on that. Um, but before we go back to that, I would like to go over to Mr. Martin Frick. Martin, you ha also have a long history of working in the field of climate uh, and as a supporter of the circular economy concept. And I know you also have a humanitarian background even before that. Um, you are the deputy to the special envoy for the UN Food System Summit 2021. Before that and after that, because you will go back to that position, you are a senior director at the UNFCCC. Um, and uh, you were an ambassador, lead negotiator for the EU. You've, you've, you've seen this topic from so many different angles. Um, and in the GAP report, I wanted to just read out this beautiful quote, this beautiful endorsement uh, that you wrote that says, for billions of years, our home planet operated in a perfect cycle. New life emerged from the same carbon that existed as life before. We're running out of time to restore this balance and achieve carbon neutrality. For that, we need to eliminate waste and create products that last, can be repaired, and ultimately be transformed into new products. But what struck, struck me so much in that, what you wrote, is um, that, that vision of the planet is already a circular system. And um, I want to ask you, in our efforts, in everything we're trying to do and design and, and come up with, how do we put that natural circularity of life central? How do we keep that in the middle? Well, thank you and <clears throat> congratulations to this report. Um, I find myself nodding all the time to your findings. Oh, that's I a good sign. <laughs> it's worthwhile mm -hmm. recalling that it is, you know, in the life of this planet, a split second in which we basically lost the circularity of our economy. What we are doing, what you described as linear economy, is relatively new. I mean, <laughs> I'm a German national and I grew up without plastic bottles. There was no such thing than plastic waste. Um, bottles were recycled, they came back, were refilled. Some of them were a little scratchy, but nobody, um, nobody took issue with that. And I think we need to start by understanding that our production model that basically extracts natural resources, produces and then throw it away is so obviously not what can work. And in food systems, this is, you know, why I'm quite passionate and why I was happy to take on this new role. I would agree that in a perfect food system, as our ancestors had, it, there is a closed circle in which nothing gets wasted. And just by the addition of water and sunlight, you are being fed again and again and again. But in too many places, we are working in food production as in mining. We extract, we ruin soils, we deplete forests, we deplete watersheds and basically do all of that for a short-term gain. So it's also something and you know I might be putting a big register here but something I find that affects human dignity because we are not valuing what we are having. We are throwing away, we are looking for fast satisfaction with the next thing to buy that only lasts a couple of weeks and is then thrown away. I read a study um, some months back um, that was before COVID obviously, that you know many young women in London, for example, would buy a t-shirt to go clubbing and not even care to wash it, but throw it away. And next week, because t-shirts are so cheap, they're being bought again. 
And that's not only an environmental issue. We know perfectly um, what human price this cheap production also implies. Yeah. And so I totally agree with the minister from Peru who just spoke that it's not about a label here and a word here and a bit of finance there. It's an overarching way of looking at things and bringing different issues really together. Yeah, exactly. And especially in the area of nutrition that we've been speaking about, these human needs and planetary needs obviously uh, collide and come together. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about, from your role, um, what is happening at the United Nations? What, what is happening there to make the food system more circular? That's a wonderful question, because um, there will be the summit of the Secretary General in September at the margins of the General Assembly, but it's really only the tip of the iceberg, because we are in the midst of a one-year engagement process with every single member state of the United Nations. We are offering to go to every single country with what we call food system summit dialogues to broker all of society conversations around food systems. Because it's not only an issue for the Minister of Agriculture, it's also an issue for ministers of health, transport, youth, labor, what have you. And, you know, not only an all of government is, approach is needed, but we need to bring all groups of society, in particular the most vulnerable one. So our hope with this summit is that in the end, um, when we have leaders in one room or virtually in one room, um, and we build energy and commitment that this translates into communities of action and practice on the ground, and we hope to see many, many heads of states presenting new national action plans that would in particular also resonate and connect with the nationally determined um, contributions under the Paris Agreement. Yeah, exactly. So really trying to bring it together in a systemic way. Exactly. That seems to be a theme as well in this conversation, bringing it together, aligning all these different agendas and, uh, and topics, because it's all really about the same, actually. Um, OK, let us listen to our third panelist, Professor Anthony Young, Director for Climate Change and Green Growth that department at the African Development Bank. Uh, and in the bank, there's all kinds of interesting initiatives around circular economy as well. Uh, Mr. Nyong was named in the top 20 of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. It's an honor that you're joining us in this conversation. Um, I want to start by asking you, because we're jumping from Lima to the south of Germany to Abidjan, uh, what can we learn from the African continent in our quest to build this circular system and this climate neutral society? Yeah, thank you so very much and thanks to the authors of this very interesting uh, reading. I think nothing really shocks us more than when we see facts and figures, you know? It really calls our attention to the fact that things need to be done. So thanks to my fellow panelists. But let me mention that um, this is an exciting time for the African continent. You know, everybody looks at Africa as a land of biodiversity, rich biodiversity, and so on. But as back, way back as 2008, I recall um, working on a document with the uh, WWF, World Wildlife Fund for Nature, and the report came out uh, stating that Africa's ecological footprint is not as good as people think it is. There's a lot of depletion. That is going yeah. on. Now we know that most of Africa's development is based on the environment, based on natural resources. And the rate at which we were going, it wasn't going to be long before we became stranded. So that was the Africa um, uh, ecological footprint result. We resolved a couple of things. One was that we were going to transition Africa to green growth, which Basically, the circular economy is a, a constituent part of. You know, it was important because the facts stood us in the face, and we knew we needed to do that. So, having said that, that has influenced the things that we are doing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we know was quite important <laughs> to us was climate change, and we were able to see the link between the climate change element and the circular economy element. 
largely through nature-based solutions. So what we did was we did an assessment, we worked with African countries, later did the assessment and looked at how many uh, African countries may have they identified the opportunities for secularity in their nationally determined contribution, mm -hmm. because this was very important. And we found that when we looked at those NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, we found things like uh, green cities, which have just been talked about, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency for mitigation. We saw sustainable production, consumption, a lot of that, and also for the adaptation. So that encouraged us to say, yeah, we are on the same page. We know what it is we want to do. Yeah. So we looked at Africa's lifestyles generally. When you look at our lifestyle, so what I've said is we, we're not just doing things haphazardly. We looked at our lifestyle. The typical African, like the family I grew up in, you know, if you are not the first child, you hardly will have new clothes. Exactly. The first yeah. one will pass yeah. down, the second will pass down to the third. And there's nothing more secular than that. If you look at the West today, fashion industry and fabric constitutes a very major part of it. So when we put all these things together, we realize we need to have a clear pathway for our secular economy initiative. So yeah. we worked with African countries to launch the Africa Secular Economy Alliance, which is basically a, a government-led coalition of African nations and global partners for one purpose, committed to advancing the secular economy transition at the national, regional, and continental level. We cannot afford to have a golden tooth in a mouthful of decay. If one country gets it right exactly. and the other does, it hasn't dented anything. So we want a coalition that brings together all these African countries. And that's what the Africa Secular Economy uh, Alliance Very interesting. Very interesting. I, I really love what you're saying about not having a haphazard way of moving forward, but rather really thinking it through. What does green growth mean? How we can, use, how we can we use nature-based solutions as a link between this circular economy and climate agenda? And also, just value what you have. How can you make your things last long, right? Um, yeah. And as you say, like, it's not only relevant for the African continent that you can't have a mouth of decaying teeth and then only one golden one standing out because that, you can't eat with a mouth like that. Um, but that also is relevant for the, the world, right? Because we have a global economic system and, uh, and it's a very linear system and we're extracting resources from one part of the world often to use in a different part of the world. Um, so my question to you is how could we really build that global coalition in solidarity with each other, who should take what leadership in that quest? Yeah, when we looked at Africa's um, ecological depletion, the paradox of it was that it was, this was resources extracted from one place and used to develop another place, leaving the place uh, bare. I think there just has to be a, a, a corporate social responsibility, basically to realize that these are global resources, but there's, it's not a mistake that some of them are where they are. And we need to practice sustainable production and consumption. Yeah. Most, like, my, like the previous speaker has spoken, because things are cheap, you buy a t-shirt, you wear it and discard it, you know? It's not sustainable. We need to be able to go beyond that and say, look, the developed countries, just because you can buy Africa's products for a nickel, for a dime, you know, and use it anyhow, doesn't mean you need to do it, you know. Yeah. So there has to be a responsibility on all sides that no single region, no single institution can solve the secularity problems on the continent. Yeah. There's something that we are seeing which is really bothering us. Sorry if I may just point this out. Everyone talks about secularity, let's recycle. We're seeing a lot of clothes that have reached their end life being packaged and sent across as used clothing for many African countries, where the next step is to bury them because they are dead. And I don't think corporately it is right for us to do this, you know? That is not what so circular said, economy should be about. That's not what circular economy is all about. Yeah. We need to be able to do this. When first, when COVID came, you saw the Africans come up with wonderful fabric masks. 
lovely. These are pieces of cloth that could have been thrown away because they were not big enough to make a shirt or a dress for a child. But we put the very good use. They became very wonderful face masks, you know? People yeah. are thinking, what is it that yeah. they can do? They have seen yeah, more thank and more you. Exactly. Where the end product of one agricultural product, like rice husk, is becoming increasingly the input, you know, for exactly. generating electricity or something else. So a lot of things are happening on the African continent. Yeah. But the beauty of it is we are also learning from the developed world what we from, should From both sides. We don't thank have you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for that that framework, that model of thinking. Actually, on the one hand, we need that. Take we have our global resources. We all need to take responsibility for that. On the other hand, we can take a very local approach to how we make things circular, and not a fake circular approach where we send very old things to the other side of the world and think we've done a good thing by recycling them. Yeah. And I, I I I wanted to give His Excellency Mr. Kihandria um, the opportunity to also react from your side of the, of the world and from your position on uh, building this global coalition and taking our responsibility together. What do you think is needed for that, to be able to take that responsibility? What is crucial? I, I think that collaboration and, and cooperation will be, will be crucial. I think uh, something that can, that can help to build this, this, this coalition is to connect circular, circularity with, with other um, concerns that are happening in the, in, the, in the discussion of the development agenda uh, right now. For instance, um, climate change. Something we have done, for instance, in Peru, where, where circularity is one of the four pillars of our, of our NDC, together with, with nature-based solutions, together with electrification of the economy or the deployment of, of uh, renewable energies. So we, we, we need to align uh, the, 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 the agendas of, of, of these issues and, and, and see where are they interconnected and, 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 and try to, to, to use the momentum uh, that, that, that it's already happening uh, regarding some of these processes, for instance, the, 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 the discussions that, that, that CDV is, 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 going, is going to have uh, regarding the new post-2020 framework, and, and how do we uh, include the, the, the division of circularity in, this, in, in these processes uh, to, yeah. to avoid generating a, a new space or a new uh, uh, discussion uh, that, 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 that could perfectly fit in, 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 in these broader discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Mr. Frick, I, I also wonder if you could very briefly speak to this point, coming from the United Nations, obviously, how, uh, what is still needed to, to really be able to say that we have this global coalition that is moving forward together? That's a big question. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, if, if I'm to give a very, very short answer, is it's got to be people together. Um, and we live in a complicated world. People sit in their sectors of expertise on their portfolios. They are extremely equipped in their specific area of expertise. But what's often lacking is lateral thinking and it's the connection to yeah. other people. So we need this all encompassing conversations. Yeah. Wow, I'm impressed by how you managed to answer <laughs> such a big question in such a concise and such a wise way. Thank you for that. We are getting towards the end of our event already. I wish we had so much more time to deepen this conversation and see which links there are and everything that we can learn uh, from each other. But already, um, this was, was so rich. The challenges that we face, we need to make sure that financing of these uh, strategies becomes available, uh, that we change our thinking to more lateral thinking, um, that we see our resources as, as global resources, um, that we look at uh, all the interesting solutions that are happening on the ground in different sides of the world, different parts. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. And thank you very much for opening our minds uh, in this panel, gentlemen. In closing, I would like to, um, we have Martijn back here, the CEO of Circle Economy, to wrap up together. Martijn, we've listened 
uh, to these honorable speakers, very experienced speakers. I would like to hear from you what inspired you most from our conversation today. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Lynn. I think it was a very rich uh, a, a conversation. And uh, to me, there were sort of three things, at least, I wrote down uh, while I was listening to the, uh, to the panel and uh, my colleagues. And, you know, the first thing is, of course, the core message of doubling circularity in 10 years. Uh, and with that staying in with the Paris goals, I think is a, quite a bold conclusion uh, that comes out of this report. Um, but also, of course, that is not an easy talk. I think we heard about lateral thinking, building coalitions. Uh, and I think it would require interventions on nation level, on city level, on business level to make that happen. So that's maybe the first point. Mm -hmm. And I think the second uh, point, I think I heard a lot of links between circularity and other big societal themes. Um, and to us, it's always like circularity is a means to an end. Yes. And I think here in this report, we linked it to climate change, uh, but you could also link it to biodiversity. I've heard uh, other topics like more, you know, uh, a just and fair society. The social aspects. Social similar. aspects. Um, so maybe some suggestion for Mark here for some future, uh, future topics for the report. Reports, yes. Um, and then maybe the, the, the first one I think is really, um, I became more and more optimistic listening to these uh, comments because Wonderful. I think the report also shows and the con conversation shows it can be done, right? There is a path. There have been interventions that have been identified um, to make this happen. Um, yeah. And I think it all depends a bit on the choices we make. Definitely. Thank you, Martijn, for that. Indeed, I have the same feeling. There is so much that we can be doing. There's also wonderful human beings that are already really doing their best, uh, as we heard in the panel, and, and mustering up the political will and, and getting people together uh, to make steps. Thank you all for participating today in this event. Uh, you can find the report at circularity-gap.world. It's very interesting. I read every word in it. I learned a lot. Uh, contact Circle Economy if you would like to be a collaborator, a co-creator in this. Um, and indeed, this report sketches a possible future, a vision on the future and what we are capable of uh, as humans, as part of this web of life, uh, this circular champion, our living planet. And uh, I wish us all good luck. And uh, I look forward to our progress in the next year. Thank you for watching. <laughs>